একজন ওইদিকে আরেক হগুসান ইন নরওয়ে very beloved friend of us and uh, our her husband ogi she is he is going to connect tomorrow uh, in a, in our west mid east program sydney is also as well as uh, she is going to join in our west mid east program tomorrow so let's have our uh, second session a uh, third session of second day the final session um, the subject is made uh, made in bangladesh a case study anyway sydney please start your keynote paper thank you hey. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed and Sadia and Ghalib and everybody there. I appreciate your help. Um, I had wanted to start this with a trailer of the film made in Bangladesh. Um, I don't know if the tech staff is hearing me, if they can do it. I asked them if they could put it on. Um, question, are they able to put on that trailer that I asked for? Maybe not. I hear no answer. So, if not, I shall begin. I wanted the trailer so you would see this beautiful see, film. Still time. Meanwhile, can we start and if we uh, do it in the middle sometime, someplace? Okay, when it's ready, you tell me. Okay. So um, this case study was written to encourage emerging filmmakers to take advantage of the uh, possibilities to move forward and to encourage all filmmakers, take your film beyond the primary public viewers to those people who are not cinephiles, but whose greater interests are lying in the social matter, in the social subject matter of the film. This may mean choosing film festivals, by subject matter, and it may mean traveling to workshops that are held in conjunction with top international film festivals where the industry goes to network. Even if you cannot travel, when you meet someone in the film business or within the social sphere of your film story, consider that one day you may work with them and think about what would that look like as you speak to them. Uh, look to others for role models. The person and their journey are both parts of a modeling process for you to follow or not to follow, depending on your own journey, which only unfolds as you go. Rubiat Hossein, the director of the film Made in Bangladesh, um, is an example of someone from a small, not very prolific international filmmaking country, Bangladesh, who's made a film quite particular to Bangladesh but also totally universal. Its subject matter reaches every society in the world in one way or another. With the proper marketing and outside circumstances being favorable, a well-made film can reach its proper audiences. So Made in Bangladesh, directed by Rubiat Hossein, had its world premiere in the Toronto International Film Festival in 2019. The festival's artistic director, Cameron Bailey, said of the film's main character, she's the Norma Ray we need now. In this story, the ugly walls of resistance arise when a young Dhaka woman attempts to organize a union with her garment factory coworkers to fight the exploitive labor practices and the global trade apparatus which supports these practices. The story is rather similar to Norma Rae, a seven, 1979 film that was made in America starring Sally Field about a textile worker and a young single mother uh, who agrees to help unionize her mill despite the problems and dangers involved. However, it's different in that its relevance in today's consumer society where the abyss between the haves and the haves not, have nots is greater by the day, both entertains us and spurs us to ask, what can we do to make things better? 
Writing for CinemaScope, Dana Reynolds described the film as, quote, a vision of feminist solidarity in the face of overwhelming opposition. And Jordan Mintz of The Hollywood Reporter called it a portrait of social rebellion, which definitely deserves wider attention. The film has won prizes in Canada, Norway, Italy, Sweden, China, France, and the US, thus establishing the filmmaker's place throughout the world. The film won the Premio Interfedi Award in the Torino Film Festival 2019, the Audience Award at the African Diaspora Film Festival in New York, and the Norwegian Peace Film Award at the Tromsø International Film Festival. It's currently up for a Golden Globe 2020. And um, if you get this paper or you can go straight to IMDb, you can see a list of its seven wins and its four nominations as well as the list of festivals. This is also important for you as a, a filmmaker to follow her steps. It's good for networking. If you do follow in your role model's footsteps and you don't have to dog her steps, you don't have to bother her with all your questions, but you can find her way and decide to go with it or not to go with it. Now, once a film gets into distribution beyond the mainstream theaters, or television and streaming, as I mentioned, the subject matter may take the film to other audiences. For instance, in France and in England, the educational reach of this film will extend its life into the world of fashion design and best practices. In the US, its life is extended through NGOs and social action groups, which deal in human trafficking and women in the labor force. For the past three years, but not this COVID-19 year, I've taken the two-day journey to Bangladesh where I serve as the director of the Women's Conference of the Dhaka International Film Festival. The first, second, and third times I went, what always strikes my admiration, first of all, are the beautiful designs of the fabrics that women wear. I'm wearing a beautiful, beautiful shawl that I bought there one day. Um, these fabrics, even the poorest women wear saris of such original print design and in such a special combination of colors, you must admire it. I felt very at home watching this film and I enjoyed seeing the protagonist not only come into her own, but to exceed her own boundaries in her mind that this Bangladesh tale of female empowerment is based upon a true story of one woman makes the real life saga, which is still going on, all the more important and relevant to who we are and what we are all going through today. Back to the fabrics of the clothes worn by the Bangladesh women that inspire me. So if I were a designer, I would be mining the country for original prints and textiles. This film gives you a deeper look into the Bangladesh textile industry and you become aware of the dichotomy between the richness of color and design and the poverty of the sweatshops that create clothes for Western consumers. The outstanding cinematic depiction of color and design in the sweatshop is notable. For example, one day everyone's working on green material the next day, they all work on blue or yellow items, adding a touch of beauty to the otherwise drab environment of women working on noisy sewing machines all day. I was able to ask Rubiat about this during the question and answer after the screening that was held by the Hollywood Foreign Press Association for the Golden Globe Awards. I asked her to speak about the beautiful color design of the film and the clothes. And she answered me, she said, I love working in colors. Color is very important. Bangladesh is very colorful, the rickshaws, the women's clothes. I was inspired by the paintings on rickshaws. Rickshaw art itself is hand painted in bright saturated colors. It's very aesthetic. Rich colors also represent the spirit of youth. Most of the women are young. They like fashion, they dress up, even going to the factory, which they say is going to the office. Dhaka at the same time is a dark city. There's not a lot of electricity. So I juxtapose dark and bright bursts of light and color. 
So with my production designers, I wanted to use color in a strong way and also use darkness and color side by side. The purpose is to make you feel the space through color and sound. The people of Bangladesh are poor but proud people who have very happy moments and color accentuates their well being. Colors form a centerpiece for this story. They're outstanding and they're very purposeful. They actually do work on color lots every day at the factory, but here the colors have more meaning. Yellow is the color of sickness, red is the color of danger. The colors set the mood of the day and the action of that day in the plot of the film itself. Now, I did want to show the trailer here. Um, I don't know if I could try it. I'll wait for you all to show it. I'm afraid I'll get offline and get lost in this internet world. So I'll continue. Uh, the appalling gap between those who make the clothes and those who buy them with the large number of middle men, men, middle men between the two is illustrated in the film when the protagonist, whose name is Shimu, speaks to the labor organizer leader, Nasima Appa, who says, you see two or three of these t-shirts, they sell for as much as you make in one month. Moreover, the workers can't get overtime pay due to them. They are harassed for asking about it or they're harassed for whatever reason their bosses might choose, including sexual favors. They hold their position at the whim of the boss. When they begin to organize a union, one is fired and her only other recourse to earn a living is to become a prostitute. About the director, Rubiat Hossein. She's one of Bangladesh's handful of women filmmakers and she's chosen to bring the eye of the public to look at women and really see them. And in this film, to see how their cheap labor across the globe shapes all of our lives. Her first film was the critically acclaimed feature film called Meha Rajan, I don't know if I pronounced it right, in 2011, which premiered at the Dhaka International Film Festival. It faced political and cultural wrath in Bangladesh for its anti-war narrative and its criticism of masculine nationalism from a feminine point of view. Um, she proceeded to make the film Under Construction 2015. And again, I'm not sure, but it might have premiered at the Dhaka International Film Festival. I don't recall. I mean, I, I had it written and now I don't see my notes. Yes, um, it was in Dhaka Festival under the construction, but not the Meher Ah, Thank okay. Okay. So under construction was. And after Dhaka, it went to the International uh, Director Showcase at the Seattle International Film Festival. And then it was theatrically released and very well received in Bangladesh. Her third feature, Made in Bangladesh, premiered at Toronto, as I said, and is internationally represented for sales by Pyramid Films, a top tier international film agent that's based in Paris. Rubiat Hossein is more than a filmmaker, however. She's an accomplished writer and an interdisciplinary researcher. She uses a feminist lens to deconstruct the otherwise phallocentric institution of cinema and of other such institutions which run our society. She completed her Bachelor's of Arts in Women's Studies from Smith College in the US and her Master's of Arts in South Asian Studies from the University of Pennsylvania in the US. Her primary fields of interest are Sufism, Bengali nationalism, formation of Bengali modernity, and its correlation with female sexuality. Hossein has also worked for prominent women's rights NGOs in Bangladesh, such as Ain O Shalish Kedra and Nari Poka, excuse my bad pronunciation. She's worked as part-time lecturer in the Department of Economic and Social Sciences at Brock University, Dhaka, uh, since 2006. And currently she lives in Dhaka and New York, making films while attending the Tisch School of Arts at New York University in Cinema Studies. 
When asked how she came to make this film, she answered, I've always been interested in examining on screen women's lived experiences and social conditions. When I was making Under Construction, the idea of this film came to me. Under Construction is about a modern Muslim woman in a struggle to find herself in the sprawl of urban Bangladesh. I began researching for three years, starting in 2013, when the eight-story Rana Plaza garment factory collapsed in Dhaka with a death toll of 1,134 people. I met lots of factory workers because I had no experience working in a factory. And when we all went to a clothing factory, I met and saw the women there, and the idea of this film came to me. I met the workers there, and I finally came across this woman named Dahlia Akhtar, who was a union leader. I felt she was courageous, strong, and articulate. She had been treated so badly, being in an abusive marriage, but she was longing for dignity. Dahlia had run away from home when she was 12 to avoid a marriage, and she came to Dhaka. It's a pretty common situation for young women in rural areas. However, it was a very brave act to run away when you're so young and your parents want to marry you off. Lots of girls just get married. If Dahlia had stayed in her village, she would have already had three or four children and she wouldn't work. Work is an empowerment. So I began to write my story, which is loosely based on real events of her life. She showed me that the women's strength was making changes in the patriarchal capitalistic infrastructure. Muslim women workers in Bangladesh were not just victims as I had previously thought, but were acting to take control of their situation there. The factory workers are very young, mainly between 18 and 30. There are over a million young women like Dahlia working in the garment industry, mostly in their mid twenties. Some are divorced, some are married, and some have never been married. It's hard to find older factory workers as they develop back and shoulder problems as a result of sitting on hard benches, bent over sewing machines 10 hours a day, six days a week for 100 euros a month in the best case. But what I found fascinating was that even with very little pay, difficult conditions at work, struggles against patriarchy at home, these women are empowered because 100 years ago in Bangladesh, women could not even work. They had to live in seclusion. Today, they are working. They're making a living for themselves and their family. I have to correct this. 100 years ago in Bangladesh, Bangladesh was not Bangladesh, but you get the idea. Uh, today, they're working and they're making a living for themselves and their families. And they are fighting within the factory and at home for their rights. They're proud to have these jobs, which are, in fact, giving Bangladesh momentum in creating wealth as a country. I asked her, what did she think about the way the film's protagonist, Shimo's husband, behaved? And she answered, the masculinity in Bangladesh is really struggling right now. Men are losing some of their power. I've seen a lot of garment workers whose husbands didn't work. These men are living off their wives' salary, and as a result, they become insecure, and they start trying to control something in their wives' lives. I wanted to show that in this relationship, the job in the beginning is a trap, but it becomes a place of empowerment later. When Shimo leaves home after being locked up by her husband, she knows that he might not take her back, but she goes to the job anyway. One of her striking lines is, we are women, screwed if you get married, screwed if we're not. And um, this led um, Hossein to say, yes, I wanted to put that line on a t-shirt. Unfortunately, they didn't put that line out on a t-shirt, but they did use t-shirts as a way to merchandise this film in France and to get rights buyers from other countries to buy the film, they gave him the t-shirts. Um, I don't know if I can screen share, but I have some statistics about the ready-made industry, the strongest element in Bangladesh 
in the fiscal year 2018 to 19. Um, I won't, I'm not going to go into the screen share right now, but it's important to know that um, that sector exported um, around US dollars, um, 34 million US dollars, which is 84.21% of the total export of the country. The apparel industry of Bangladesh started in the 1980s when outsourcing began. And according to the Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association, one of the largest trade associations in the country, representing the ready-made garment industry, although it started in 1983 with only 12 members, currently it has 4,621 member factories, a total of three 1,856 factories have been identified as operational and only 3.8% out of these 3,856 factories are unionized. About 3.6 million workers are reported to be, sorry, what? Yeah, just one minute. We are uh, changing the internet line. So just one, uh, I mean, uh, 30 seconds maybe or one minute. Just hold on, please. Okay. We, we're we are, we are switching internet line, another one. This one is disturbing yeah, a little bit. Mm. Malaika, are you here, Meryl? Can you hear me? Hello. 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 I'm here. Hi, everyone. Hello. Okay. Uh, Malaika, let me introduce you the keynote paper presenter, Sydney Levin. You know, and uh, uh, there's another beautiful lady here, Gida, and she's from Norway. She's the uh, head of the New Nordic Film Festival in Norwegian International Film Festival in Horbushen. And nice. in that night, sitting Mr. Mofidul Haq, he is our uh, board of member of the Dhaka International Committee. And uh, two uh, filmmaker, uh, uh, what, what, two more person here is. Uh, Mr. A.K. Reza Ghalib and Sadia Khalid Riti, they are in charge of our West Mid East program. So uh, the, all kinds of things are going on. And you, we are middle of the keynote paper, Sydney Levin. We just uh, asked her to one minute break because the internet line was, something was interrupting. So we are now, uh, yeah. So Sydney, if you want to screen, uh, want to show us the, screen we can share the screen now yeah okay okay let me see if i can figure out how i do that share screen uh yeah can you see this no we still see you you just see me hold and yes. shift to select i don't know how to do it then not not no it no it's okay yes we can see it Yes. Ah, okay. So a little statistics about the garment industry, which the movie, of course, is about. And there's a particularly important point in this that I shall elaborate on. But the ready-made uh, industry is the strongest element of Bangladesh development in this last 2018, 2019. And the sector exported in the volume of 34 point. $133 million US, of which 84.21% of the total export of the country 
was the garment industry. The apparel industry started its journey with outsourcing in 1980s. And according to the Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and the Exporters Association, one of the largest trade associations of the country representing the ready-made garment industry. Though it started in eight, 1983 with only 12 members, it currently has 4,621 member factories and a total of 3,856 factories have been identified as operational. And of those, only 3.8% are unionized, which our story is all about, that small segment. About 3.6 million workers are reported to be employed there. 53% of them are female, 47% are male. But when it comes to the sewing machine operator, a whopping number of 80% are women. And the average age of the worker is 25. So with that, I'm going back off screen. If I can figure out how to get off screen now. Um, how do I get? Oh, yes. Yeah, stop share. OK. So with that in mind, um, I said uh, to Hossein, that Shimo's destiny was quite common, but she's also a real heroine. And um, Rubiat Hussein answered, she said, I myself grew up in a privileged family. I was educated. I was able to go to school, to university. I met Dahlia, the union organizer in real life in 2016 when she was 23 years old. She was the union president and pregnant. One day she came to my house and we were sitting in my study and I was interviewing her and she said, if I had been to school like you by now, I would have done something big. That really struck me emotionally. Society and fate have really put Dahlia down, but she kept this faith that one day she would amount to something. Now there is a movie about her and the world will see it. And hopefully her story and her voice will be heard globally she has reached something and she has made something big. I asked if the Nashima, uh, Nasima Appa character of the union organizer was based on a real woman. And she said, in my country, there's a long history of women's rights organizations trying to improve the conditions of women. When I met Dahlia, she told me she had gone to these meetings. Women are getting the knowledge of unions through these human rights organizations. They're taught about the law. The relationship between Nasima Appa and Shimo is similar to the kind of relationship I had with Dahlia. We're friends, but there is a social difference we can't ignore. In Bangladesh, class structures are so strong, but women are helping each other across classes. Uh, the women's status in Bangladesh seems to be paradoxical. It's paradoxical in the sense that empowerment, oppression, and fight all exist for women. Our heads of state, our head of state is a woman. The opposition leader is a woman. The speaker of parliament is a woman. In the garment industry, which earns the country's highest revenue, 80% of the workers are women. The backbone of Bangladesh's economy is carried by young women. The women factory workers have this young spirit, which I tried to portray in the film. They have a real sense of camaraderie working together. It's a positive thing. In gender studies, we always say that as long as a woman is resisting and fighting, she will get somewhere. Generations before us have fought for education and voting rights for women. And that's why we're here today. We stand where we stand because we stand on the shoulders of the women who came before us. Shimu is also fighting against misrepresentation of women given by pop culture, like the very sexist clip shown on the TV at the landlords in the movie, or the religion where the uh, Iman speech is about wearing the hijab. Shimo resists capitalism and orthodox Islamization. She creates her own synthesis of womanhood. She says her prayers, but she loves dancing. She fights for launching a union, but she does, she does it in her own way. 
Today, it is proposed, what is proposed to women stands in two extremes, the hypersexualization through ads on TV and what can be heard at the mosque, that women are basically dirty. Even if Shimu and the other women cover their heads, they do it their own way. They wear very colorful clothes. They do not hide. They are conscious of their beauty and fashion in their own way. There's still no parity, but there is an increased awareness of the new working class of young women at risk. If you recall the thousand plus dead in the factory collapse, in real life, everyone took notice, safety measures were put into place, and an awareness of the rights of workers was small, but it was still happening. The women need to be given credit for all they're doing. Representation is an adjunct of politics. Union members helped me with this script. They really wanted this story to be told and they wanted to be a part of it. In the first scene of the film, that fire scene felt very real to them all. They were reliving a trauma. There was a lot of intense moments like that in this film. Um, we asked what has happened since the story of unionizing, are things better? And Rubiat answered, she said, I ended this story with Shimu becoming the head of the union because at that point, a new chapter in her life began. It was the moment when she flipped the power structure and got what she wanted. The struggle goes on, but she is a changed woman. Um, I noticed that the last shot of Shimo shows her with her hair loose and she's a different woman. And uh, Rubiat answered that her hair progressively gets looser and looser through her empowerment process. She was wearing a hijab and during the fight with her husband, she takes it off. At the end of the movie, her hair is free as we never saw it before. Her body language expresses her feminine power. But the fight is not over. She just got to the right to begin negotiating with her bosses. They granted some rights such as higher pay and the negotiation still goes on. I think the factory conditions and security rules have improved. The workers and factory owners are working towards improving conditions further. Dahlia sent out 21 points and they were all granted, including maternity leave, fire safety training, space for childcare. Wages went up to 700 DACAs, which is less than $10. They also received a 500 DACA bonus for attendance, but less than 10% of the factories are unionized. The film was made in 2018. Then suddenly that unionized factory was closed for non-compliance of all things. Dahlia, the real life organizer, had to go to Jordan for work for six months as a migrant worker in a factory owned by an Indian. There she worked with others who spoke other languages. They had no rights, they had no citizenship, they could hardly speak together. Well, it's hard to protest for workers' rights when you're not a citizen and when migrant workers do not all speak the same language. The exploitation of labor goes so far that when one works to improve work conditions, the factories and the capital just go elsewhere. Then COVID-19 shut down everything. Since workers often share dormitories, safety was impossible. She had to go home. She had no income. Then flooding caused her to lose her home. It's a very tough time now and she's seeking work with more NGOs to continue her work as an activist. Dahlia and I got along very well, and we're now working on our next film together about how cheap labor works now across the globe. For example, something made in Jordan may well have been made by a woman from Nepal. This becomes a pathway for human trafficking and even slave labor. So what can we in the audience do? In France, this film will be released a few days after Black Friday, it was released a few days after Black Friday, which probably affected the workers' lives in Bangladesh. There was a huge impact in the factories for sure. The entire world should listen to stories like Shimu's. As a consumer, you have to take your responsibilities. 
Even if you buy a pair of jeans for $20, you must know that someone had to work underpaid for these and be curious and find out where she worked. But if you say, I won't buy any more clothes of this brand because I know they underpay their workers, that's exactly what the workers do not want. It is not a solution. Do not boycott because that deprives these workers of work. Rather, go to the companies such as Mango, Zara, H&M, and Walmart and ask them for a list of the factories they work with. See if the factories they use enforce fair labor practices. Be aware of how you spend your money for clothes and support garment workers. Support NGOs who support workers like the Solidarity Center is at the U.S. Embassy in Bangladesh. The Danish Workers Union, an NGO, is another. These NGOs work for the education and training of workers to know their legal rights. At the very least, be mindful that the clothing you are buying was made by a woman working hard for a very, very minimum wage. And be aware that in the 1960s when the uh, outsourcing labor began was when countries like Bangladesh began to have functioning economies. And today, as globalization takes new forms, issues like labor and human trafficking need to be addressed on a global level holistically. The issue was addressed at the African Diaspora International Film Festival in Manhattan as it held its first summer virtual festival. Um, there is in this um, transcript a link to the live streamed conversation and it, I give you the way to link into that conversation with the Bangladesh director Rubiat Hossein uh, addressing these issues with Hirano Adisu, who's the advocacy officer uh, with Freedom United, whose work um, is modern day slavery and human trafficking. And with Nisha Varia, the advocacy director of Human Rights Watch, Women's Rights Division, which includes women garment workers in the textile industry, government reform, and reform by suppliers and fashion brands. She conducts many campaigns to push for better practices, greater transparency, supplying funds to enforce labor laws. The conversation was moderated by the African Diaspora Film Festival's co-founder, co-director, Daria Nidasbech. And later the festival had a Q&A also worth tuning into here. We asked Rubiat, what are her hopes for this film? She said, I hope it'll be widely seen in Bangladesh, though there is strong censorship there. I want the workers to watch it. I want it to go online there so the workers can see themselves. They wanted to be a part of the film and they were. One union member helped me with the script to make it authentic. I also hope it won't only be seen in Bangladesh. The progression of the film, I asked her, from its idea to a script, to a completed film with international sales, organizations, workshops, networks, um, helped make the filmmaker uh, that we are examining here. And to give you a, a little view of the business aspect of this film, the international sales were by pyramid and the territories licensed by Pyramid um, included Midas of Portugal, which was also a producer, Francois D'Artemar produced it and put it into distribution in Portugal. Um, and French distribution was done by Pyramid, who is also the international sales agent. In US, it went out through Art Maton, uh, in Poland, it went through Canal Plus, Ale Kino. In the UK, it went out through Kursan and London Film Festival. Canada, Films We Like. China, Hualo. Kursan, UK, I said that. Singapore took the in-flight rights, Singapore Airlines. Japan took it and Australia took it. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, theaters closed down. However, it did get there and it will continue its life. 
Um, again, I have a link to the trailer and a link to the panel. And I named the production companies from France, Denmark, Portugal, Bangladesh, and they all came out of her networking activities. Um, in 2015, she won an award from Arte to develop her script under construction in Locarno. And she then met a woman from Bangladesh, I hope she's listening here, named Zamiya, uh, Samia Zaman, who is a producer whose activities have done so much for innovating and ener energizing Bangladesh cinema. In 2016, Samia Zaman brought Bangladesh filmmakers to Locarno's Open Doors when the Locarno Film Festival Open Doors was focusing on films from South Asia, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Maldives, Myanmar, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka for the next three years until 2018. Open Doors, very important for anyone listening to this who is a filmmaker, is composed of three main activities that take place during the Locarno Film Festival, the Open Doors Hub, Open Doors Lab, and Open Doors Screenings. In 2017, Locarno announced the winners of the co-production platform, Open Doors Hub. Um, the jury, very important for networking, included the director of the Cannes for Directors Fortnight, the South by Southwest film head, Janet Pearson, the Venice Days Vice Director, Sylvain Ozu, and the award went to a film called Portugal by an Estonian playwright with a $65,000 prize for post-production. Um, and the reason was it was original and it was a look at contemporary life in Estonia. To give you an idea of what sort of films win there and why some of the award women and um, why they win. Another one was called El Padre Medico and it got a prize of 5,000 euros for the creation of key art design of its poster and another 3,000 euros from the VOD platform Baltic View and Noir Lumiere for DCPs, which are very expensive and for international promotion. The reasoning for that decision was for the wonderful material and for exposing the dark side of humanitarianism. That documentary explores the life of someone who spent his life in the Amazonian jungle in the 60s under the false identity of a missionary. Um, and it was produced by a Lithuanian company, country, um, company, sorry. I'm looking. Um, Another film that won was called Little Comrade. It won 5,500 euros of advertising services and it followed a six-year-old girl, Lelo, whose mother was sent to prison during the Stalinist period in the USSR. Um, it was great storytelling, had international appeal and great performances and great historical reconstruction. Uh, the winners of the co-production platform, Open Doors, were also announced. And this gives the opportunity to the project holders, a director and one of the attached producers to present their work further, aiming at international collaborations and further financing. The Arte Prize of 6,000 euros went to Made in Bangladesh. And that also secured the support of the Cinema du Monde Commission. That meant that Rubiat would be traveling to Cannes, where Cinema du Monde has a very prominent and visible pavilion to show its latest offerings to the industry that attends. The Open Door Lab is a training worship, uh, workshop um, organized by someone named Sophie Bourdon, and it handed its awards to films in development in collaboration with the Torino Film Lab and Initiative Film. So it was there in Locarno that the producer, Francois D'Artemer, the go-to producer by th for films by filmmakers in faraway places was there. He was there with an Ethiopian film producer who knew someone named Marco Orsini, a Monaco-based producer with a group called 
I-E-F-T-A, that first brought Ethiopians to Cannes and brings other far-flung producers into the film circuit. Samia Zamin, who I had mentioned already, works with Marco and introduced Marco to Francois D'Aptemer. Marco then introduced Rubiat to Francois, who produced her next film, Made in Bangladesh, and is now producing the next film of her called Sand City. So this small circle is a perfect illustration of the sort of thing that can happen when you're traveling on the film circuit. I include it here as the reason you must go everywhere and meet everybody and be open to all introductions and also ready to follow through and follow up with all of them. You never know when the next break will be coming. So you must take advantage of everything. When Francois D'Artemer came on board, he brought with him the international sales agent Pyramid. They were able to access funding from the French national film subsidy, CNC. Rubiat got SOARS funding on her own from Scandinavia. And then as a French-Danish co-production, they were able to access European subsidy money from Eurimage. So from working with her Danish producer, she also got post-production money in Denmark. And that is how it goes. Uh, the Euromage Fund agreed to support 17 fictions, films, and two documentaries and one animation for a total amount of 3,786,000,000 euros. Um, the share of eligible projects with female directors was analyzed at their meeting, the Euromage Board of Management, and it was 41%. And the share of those that received support was 50% overall as a percentage of total projects supported, representing uh, 1.892 million euros. Um, a list of the projects that received money included Made in Bangladesh. It received 130,000 euros. And then came November 2018, all this happened before. At that time, the Torino Film Lab, which has, uh, represents a community of 700 film professionals developed internally with more than uh, 40 international partners and 93 films already produced and 20 ready to go into production in 2019. Torino Film Lab supported prize, supported events and um, that included an award um, to Made in Bangladesh of 40,000 euros. And so they were able to continue into their production. This is the route this one woman took whose footsteps you should study and follow as much as it suits your project. And along the way, you'll find other kinds of avenues opening to you. In 2019, Rubiat brought her next film, it's called Sand City, to Goa for the co-production market in India's Film Bazaar. This is such an important um, venue for South Asian filmmakers. You must go and it's closer to home and it's a very good place to begin. There, the producer Francois D'Artemer came on board again so Sand City is a look at global labor and uh, Rubiat's working on it with Dahlia and it's being directed by someone named Made Hassan and it's being produced by Adam Imtaz Ahmed, Francois Dachtmar and Rubiat Hossein herself. In 2020, Made in Bangladesh had its Swiss premiere back in Locarno Rubiat says, today, women making films is not as bad as three years ago. The Me Too movement and the 50-50 challenge show their earlier problems have been recognized and are being addressed. In the past, men distributors did not want to look at a woman filmmaker in the eye, and they talked to the man in the room. In Europe, quote, women of color were considered exotic 
and they had to watch themselves carefully as they worked with male producers. They had to make it clear to distributors that there was a universal positive to be gained by working with their films. Um, I had an interview with the international sales agent, Eric Lagesse at Pyramid. And um, I started with asking him how he got attached to Made in Bangladesh. Um, I asked him also to tell me how it was being distributed and promoted in France because I had seen a very impressive study guide on it for schools. And he said, yes, they did a four page leaflet telling more about the film and the industry in Bangladesh. And they did an interview with the director um, and they made some beautiful Echo t-shirts called Equitable, meaning equal in different colors with the title of the film. We also did a poster in Paris in the Metro. We raised partnerships with some feminist magazines, Cosette, and with cultural magazines, Telerama and Courier International. And we released the film in 40 theaters. He had the idea that they wanted to spread the campaign about best practices in the fashion industry. Um, it was released before COVID and the yellow jacket strikes shut the theaters down. Then the US released it on about 55 screens and secured a Golden Globe nomination, but it didn't go to the Academy Awards because it was not submitted to a possibly censorious Bangladesh committee. Um, Pyramid became involved at a very early stage, at the script stage. He, they read a few versions and they became very, very involved in the editing at the end of post-production. They watched the film several times trying to improve it as well as they could. And then when it premiered in Toronto, he began to do the territorial sales. It received funding, as I said, from Francis C. M. C. Aid, Au Cinema du Monde, and the Cinema du Monde, the Danish Film Institute, and Norway's Sorfund. Um, what else? I think I'm coming to an end here. I do not need to name all the funding and the production services, but if you're interested, there are many more details on the paper that you can read in Celluloid Ahmed's organizational uh, magazine. So I thank you and I will end it here. I do wish that um, we could see the trailer, but you can see it online. You can go to YouTube and see it. So thank you for listening. I hope that this was informative and I hope that it spurred you to take action for your own film project. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. <laughs> uh, we'll be, uh, maybe someone will go and ask something or anything more. Just you can uh, hear from other discussion. I mean, what they say. I uh, like Yeah, um, uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, uh, AKA Reza Ghalib, uh, who is a filmmaker from Bangladesh. In fact, he has seen the film. So let's hear from someone who has seen the film, what he has thought about it, please. Thank you, Shohan Bhai. And thank you, Sydney, for such an in-depth, extensive and informative that you have. I think you have worked very hard for writing this because it can be seen. The information you have gathered in the whole piece and, and actually you didn't read some of it, but we have gone through and seen that what you have gone through. You have interviewed Rubaiyat and also many other people. And this is a true example of a, what a case study should be for a film. And so we get to know so much about the film. And you, I, as a Shobhan Bhai, Mohammed Mustafa Jamal, whom we fondly call Shobhan Bhai, has actually mentioned that I have, have seen the film. And it is unfortunate that a film made in Bangladesh, called Made in Bangladesh, has not been able to be released in Bangladesh for some sensor issues. So I, it's so very unfortunate. Uh, I, I, I'll actually come to the film later, but I should actually just 
initially talk about uh, what you have uh, stated in your uh, presentation that the films, uh, you have mentioned everything about this film, but I see that you mentioned the content and the plot of the film, but somehow you actually, I don't know, uh, uh, didn't say anything about the aesthetic uh, film and didn't make a sort of a, didn't review the film, if I can mm -hmm. say in that sense that it was just, uh, but of course it's a case study. I don't think that it uh, has some review as a place in a case study. So as a filmmaker, I, I was very interested to see this film because as you have said that this is one of our film, first of its kind that has been released in so many theaters in Europe, across Europe. And it's a event, I think it should actually celebrate this film in that sense. Uh, and it is something which is, has uh, shown that in present situation in, for filmmakers or, or for independent filmmakers, it is not enough that you have a good script, you have a good idea or you have a good team. It is also very important that you have a good network. Otherwise, it is not possible to take your dream into execution level. So that is what has Rubai has, has shown in past all three of his films. She has gradually shown how to make a film and take it across the globe so that many people come across and to make a successful film and made in Bangladesh one of the first example of that. I have seen the film and I was really amazed by its technical quality. It was like something I don't think that it would have been possible without this kind of support that she has received, international support. And there was in on one point you said that the noise of a uh, garments factory and that noise the way that has been used in the film is something unbelievable mm -hmm. and the sound was like that those are the things actually I think we should look into uh, this film and this is what how an international film should be made and I as a Bangladeshi filmmaker and from Bangladesh there are some issues that I think only Bangladeshis will understand, which is not very, I mean, so I will say that, uh, what, uh, not realistic, I would say that these are the things, these are not discernible to Western viewers. So, and some of the things which are actually aimed at Western viewers, which are, uh, so there are, these are the issues that I have for this film, because this, I feel the only uh, concern about this film is that this is made for a Western eye. That was my mm -hmm. only concern for, I thought that, there are a few issues in the topics in the film, which I think that for a Bangladeshi uh, audience are redundant. You don't need to say that in a film because we know those things. We don't have to mention this thing. We don't have to explain for a Bangladeshi viewer. These are the redundant issues. There are some issues I'm not going to say which they are because many of you haven't seen. I, I don't think any hop in the Bangladeshi audience has seen these things. So they should I, watch, discuss these I issues. Would love I would love to hear what they are. I wish you would say it so that I can become aware of what those issues were. Could you please uh, tell us what was so obvious and that we don't understand in the West that had to be explained to us? Uh, I haven't made the note here, so I can't immediately recall those things because I thought that I would not. So I have to go through the film and give the notes. So that would have been but in well, I watch. I was watching it. I felt that those are few issues, like films in the films, which are quite obvious to Bangladeshi film audience, and that they are made. What do you call that? Uh, just explain for the Western viewers because these are the things that uh, we don't need to explain to Bangladeshi viewers. But which is not actually uh, bad or it's not a criticism. But that is my observation. That's what I would say. But I am not. I don't have any notes now, so I can't actually immediately on top of my head, I can't recall that, but that was my uh, impression when I saw that. But otherwise, as I said, this is a interesting film and it deserves what it has achieved. And for me as a filmmaker, as, as I said, that it is very important that we have learned that networking is a very important thing. But another question is like when you do networking, this is a question I'm raising over here that for a filmmaker, when you want to do networking and you want Western funds, 
And how important is it that you cater to their demand and how much you have your own freedom? I don't know. That is a, because uh, these are the questions that we are discussing in our among ourselves mm -hmm. that how, how much freedom a filmmaker actually has when he, they have to go through all this process and mm -hmm. how much actually uh, their, what you call that creativity is actually whether they are being reined by the so much uh, rules and uh, yeah. those are the things I think, but uh, I, as you mentioned that how the way actually, but many of our filmmakers are actually getting international recognition and international corporate funding as, and you have mentioned some of them like Mahdi and Shumi and Amitav Reza Choudhury who has also got a Riksha Girl, which is an international co-funded film. So this is an opportunity for Bangladeshi filmmakers to get a global recognition and global exposure. And Rubaiyat, one thing I must admit that Rubaiyat, the network she has built, she has not only taken advantage of herself, she has, one, has a production house called Khona, and she is actually, uh, what you call, the mentoring young filmmakers and giving them opportunities. And there are many films being produced from the Khona production house. One of them is was uh, uh, called uh, Postmaster, I think. Uh, this Ong Rakhain has made a short film which went to Claire for the last postman. So, so, and she's also again producing many films and actually trying to get co-production from film, other filmmakers as well. So that is also something she has actually not contributing to our film, Bangladeshi film. So not, I hope that some of them also will get uh, produced and also get uh, it released in Bangladesh and I only hope that the Made in Bangladesh gets censored in Bangladesh and everybody in Bangladesh should be able to see it. It is not only few of us who has the privilege to watch this film. So that was my take on your paper and the film itself. And one day, Sydney, I will talk to you about the, my observations. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. That's so very interesting what you say and what you bring up. And it's a definitely an issue um, that will be discussed, I hope, in East Meets West. You can often see a film made by an exotic filmmaker with European money. You can see the stamp of Europe on it. And as Eric Lages said, they worked a lot on the, the post-production. You're absolutely right. It was made for Western eyes. Um, perhaps who's, um, Rubiat really wanted it to be that way. And she in turn can act as an intermediary with the next generation of Bangladesh filmmakers and hopefully avoid that bending the film toward Western eyes so that you kind of exclude your own local populace from being able to see it. Um, what you bring up is the crux of the whole issue of filmmaking and being true to your vision. And it's a difficult one to skirt because you need the Western money. So you have to show it the Western way. And those who know authenticity are very aware of what's not authentic perhaps. Um, I'm sure Miral and Gita can talk more about that. But I did want to say that You're very important what you bring up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sydney. Actually, uh, Galib couldn't say properly. I mean, yeah, I mean, she. He didn't mention it. The thing is that uh, it, we call prescribed film or something like that. Western point of view means something they wanted to see, like country like Bangladesh or in Iran, the negative things, poverty, abusing, and other things. I mean, what kind of things? I mean, the negativity as much you can show anything. That is the most important thing. I mean, mainly. They don't want to see the progress of the, our women empowerment or whatever it is, I mean, progress or anything. They want to see the bottomless basket of Bangladesh or the, some, some sort of you know, religious violence and uh, everything. The, you know, the, if you go to Iran, you have been Iran. We've been Iran in Iranian films. In Iran, in the Western point of view, it's a country of hell. But you, you've been in Iran. I've been in Iran for 15 to 17 times. It's a, it's a heaven, it's like a heaven. The, the women filmmakers are filmmakers. They're making wonderful things. I mean, a lot of films are making, I mean, uh, from Amazing. Iran, even also in Turkey. 
So these are very interesting things. I mean, when the fund somebody the, for a Asian country or the third world country, they don't want to see the positive things. They always want to see something. You have to show this, or you have to go through this, or you have to be very careful. Those films are very technically very rich because the technical support and everything that cinematographer or editing panel, editor or everybody, sound engineer, everybody are very professional people. They, are, they bring all these people. But the ideologically, the concept of the director, I don't know how much freedom the gate the director. I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, not sure. I mean, how much they can uh, be, uh, I mean, uh, free of to make the film. Anyway, this is, uh, this is a different topic, so I don't want to say. I, I didn't see it made, of, made in Bangladesh, so I can't say anything about this film. Because, so I, I, I'm, I'm concerned about that. I know the behind the story. I mean, all these things I've seen last, uh, my uh, film, Dhaka Festival career, 30 years career. So all through, I have a long journey. I've met hundreds of people in all over the Europe and the USA and everywhere. I had a talk with many types of people. I know that I know I know their pulse, and especially uh, uh, the Iranian films. I can understand what happened with them. Anyway, so let's come to the point, and uh, I'll be very happy. Gida, are you ready yeah. to talk? Yes, yes, I'm ready. Uh, uh, I can see with your point, Ahmed, that you think that the that the Western are looking for the dark side of. Uh, the Eastern countries or the Lebanon countries, but what my impression of this film is it not like that at all, actually, because it shows the strength and an artistic uh, in integrity for the filmmaker. So I'm really, really impressed by this film. But what I think maybe it's, um, uh, it's very well done and it's, it feels very authentic. And um, and I also think that it's done with like a wonderful color. It has a strong artistic aesthetic way of telling. But the most important that the characters in the film feels they are really empowered. They are, of course, they, it's a difficult uh, working life, a difficult life, but they are still strong, still humorous, they like to dance, they have a life which is not only poverty. Can you hear me? I feel... Yeah, we can hear you. You can hear me? <laughs> Suddenly it feels like I was in my <laughs> own room. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, so that I was really impressed by. Uh, and I think what is, uh, and I think what I can understand is that the film is kind of also informative. So it tells things to the Western eye, which the Bangladeshis maybe know for sure, but it kind of pinpoints and explains uh, um, young marriage, the way, the way women have to choose between uh, give themselves, but also how to work the possibilities of being uh, economical independent um, kind of gives the woman an option to choose a life, not to have a life chosen for them. So I think uh, I can understand that lots of those things are put a little bit onto, uh, I can understand why it's like this, what's the options. Um, so I was, um, <clears throat> I was uh, very, very impressed by the film and very, very uh, moved by the film. And what I think, I think you did a wonderful uh, touring uh, a paper, Sydney. Mm, thank you. Yes, so, uh, so I think that explaining was very thoroughly with the points of view of the filmmaker, the points of view of the sales agent. And I think that, that of what, what is like the filmmaker's difficult things. It's if when you come with your project, you will meet people who want to change your project, want to take part because they're financing, they're putting something into it. And that's why it's so important in all countries, also in Norway, that you have 
people around you who can support your artistic integrity. And that you also are very aware and you can use all of these inputs. You, do, we don't, you don't need to be learned to be a filmmaker. None, none of the emerging filmmakers needs to learn to be a filmmaker, but they, uh, they, can, they need to kind of resist and stay in their intention. What film am I making? And then take the feedback and then think about it and use the ones uh, in a constructive way. So I think that's that's like a, a, a challenging for all young filmmakers, all emerging filmmakers, also, also in Norway, in the Nordic countries, you will, all of the filmmakers are struggling with the thing that you have people like all the wheel of distribution, the international sales, the festivals, everyone wants to, kind of advice to push the movie in different kind of direction. And I think it's also very important to, to learn how to stand by your, to be the captain of your own ship. And that's, uh, that could be very challenging. Um, and I can't, uh, when, I, when I see this film, I think a lot about this is how, uh, this is how like the first factory workers in Norway, they also had to fight in the, on the Western countries, has to fight really hard to get union and get the, get the rights. So I think it's kind of a very in process and it's fantastic that it happens to things. And I think it's a shame that still the film is not available for the Bangladesh audience so they can see it themselves. Uh, because I think it's so important. And what kind of struck me is that this film, it's not like this, it's, it's dramatic events that happens in the film where one get fired, have to, you can, you can see that she has only one option is go to prostitution, but it's very subtle. It's not like, a, it's not like pushed over with darkness. It's so much hope in this film. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if we want to, we can open the discussion more, but uh, um, yeah, I think this is, a, I, I can speak a lot about other things around this, but I think it's maybe more interesting to have a more open discussion. If I could add something here, um, I would like to, because um, about keeping that artistic integrity and not bending too much. There was another example. This one I think really did work, but maybe only for Western eyes. I wish it could be seen in Bangladesh so we could get some real feedback beyond Galib's feedback, which is very important. But an example of not bending to the will of those who are trying to help you make the movie in the West was I saw this movie, the Moroccan submission for the Academy Award called The Unknown Saint. And in order to make his message, it had to be a comedy. But when he went to the Sundance workshop to workshop it, he wouldn't take anyone's suggestions he wouldn't try any kinds of changes that they were suggesting. And it had not a note of comedy in it. it. You knew it should be a comedy, but it was so serious and therefore so unsuccessful because he would not allow anyone to tell him what to do. So um, there's a thin line between so that, yes. standing firm. You, I you, agree. You guys are lucky. You have seen the film because unfortunately oh. we, we couldn't see the film. And uh, anyway, let's hope for the best. Maybe in a near future we'll watch this movie. Maybe in some other city or any festival. I don't know. Wow. Anyway, um, let's continue our discussion. But Gita, thank you very much for your nice observation. Yes, of course, I'm sure it is a good film. I mean, as a filmmaker, but normally what I said before is I know the point of view. Of, I mean, when the funding coming from the abroad, most of the times what happened? I mean, the, the topics they want to see. I mean, the, the, that is the main um, 
message of the funding, most of the time it happens. Like in NGOs in working in our country, I mean, uh, we have seen many things, I mean, as, as like this. It's happening in Rohingya camp, especially. Mm -hmm. Believe me, the government has spent millions of dollars, I mean, millions of taka for rehabilitation in a, somewhere in a one place. And there's a big propaganda not to go there. I mean, uh, the, the, these things, I mean. But the people went there, uh, they are now welcoming, the, they're calling the other Rohingyas to come to join them in the new camp, where they have actually the nice environment, the health issues and then everything, big house and everything, so many things is there. So sometimes it what happened, I mean, Western Fund, when they come to the third world country, they have uh, some hidden uh, hidden agenda is there. It, 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 it is there very much, especially country like in Bangladesh. I mean, it's faced a lot of things. After our independence, we have seen many things, many lot of propagandas and everything we have seen. Anyway, so this is not our topics today. Our topics about Made in Bangladesh, the film. So we'll continue with it. Uh, before Malaika, I'll ask Sadia Khalid Riti, uh, the film critic from Bangladesh. She is going to speak a few words. After that, I'll hear uh, from Malaika, please. Hi, everyone. Hi, Sydney, Malika, and uh, Gida. 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 I hope I got it right. Yeah. Uh, very warm uh, afternoon to you all. And I have not seen the film, so I cannot talk about it. But the reason I'm here is that someone who has seen the film uh, is in the audience, but she is. She doesn't want to. She doesn't want to participate. So okay. So I've seen another film of Rubaiyat. So I'll just uh, uh, pitch in uh, about that. Um, I saw Under Construction, and I was really appreciative of it. Mm, I really liked how she portrayed the upper middle class woman whose um, whose husband isn't really giving her the attention or the love that she needs and so she really seeks it somewhere else so that was really um uh, that was like a revelation to see on screen and i really um commend Rubata for doing that um yes what uh, what sydney mentioned about um Rubat helping others with uh, their projects and um uh, galib also said um, that is very true. She actually has a new um, initiative coming up this uh, month that's called Sultana's Dream. And through that initiative, what she's doing is um, she is calling for stories from female filmmakers. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, new uh, uh, emerging fem uh, female filmmakers under the age of, I think, 30 or 35, um, they can submit their stories and then revile uh, will arrange workshops and mentorships. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a very long-term plan, I think for six months or something. And mm -hmm. then she will help them produce their films. So she does these things for uh, the new filmmakers and the women filmmakers especially. So we really respect her for that. And I hope to see Made in Bangladesh in some other film festival. Hopefully it gets censored and we can see it here in Bangladesh. Um, so, so that made in Bangladesh can also be made for Bangladesh. And thank you. That's all from me. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, now time to hear something from Malaika. Uh, she's a film programmer. Gida is a film producer, and uh, Malaika also a film producer. So two producer is here. It's a very lucky and one director is here. One critic is there. And as a festival director, like a programmer or Mofidul Haq, he's also a festival programmer for, he has a film festival at the Liberation War Museum. He is a, one of the trustee. They have a, films about the independence or uh, 
uh, free uh, struggle uh, movement films. I mean, anyway. So Malaika, as a producer, I'm sure you have a, a very different thoughts about all these things. I mean, you have seen the film. I'm sure you have seen it by this time. So let's uh, hear something from you. Thank you. Can't hear you. You're mute. You're on mute. Malika, you Hi, have to. Can you, can you yeah. hear me now? Yeah. Now we can okay, hear. sorry. Is it sorry. Miral or Malika, your name? Miral? Yeah, Miral Malika, yes. Okay. <laughs> it's nice to see you after Berlin or LA. I don't know when was the last time. I don't know either. <laughs> Um, it's nice to be here with you. Um, good afternoon, uh, fellow panelists and all participants again. And uh, I'm very, very, very um, honored to be here. Uh, let me first um, begin by congratulations the organizers uh, for uh, shaping this amazing panel and bringing through this incredible film. Um, I, I have to say that I was, I was um, literally um, blown away by the by this amazing movie and uh, um, and also you pounded out uh, it's also a Eurimash co-production and uh, um, a part of being a producer, I am also a political advisor to the European Parliament and, and, and also worker uh, for a long long time I was at the Council of Europe at the Eurimash and in charge of Eurimash. That's why I'm very happy that this movie is from us. And then we supported this movie. And, uh, and I, I'm going to join you ladies saying that I didn't see the movie in um, a perspective of um, uh, like kind of a negative image of Bangladesh. Actually, for me, Made in Bangladesh is a quite powerful example of what coll collective effort is about. And this drama from uh, kind of a drama is actually a colorful one, um, uh, portraying uh, this woman um, as a kind of a true social rebellion, uh, but in a good, good way. Uh, for me, it's just, uh, like representing um, the, the social dynamic and it's kind of like a feminist activity without, uh, you know, um, being dramatized. Uh, it's, 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 it's a kind of like a, like a flag of feminist solidarity uh, made in Bangladesh. And uh, I feel it's so, um, you know, overwhelmed by that. And um, I, I, I really feel it like, like that uh, for, for my point of view. Um, it's yet true that Bangladeshi women face numerous challenges, uh, but not only Bangladeshi women, all the women are, are, are facing challenges right now. Um, going to the, the, the fact that I'm gonna take this, uh, I, I'm also political, that's why I'm gonna just see it in a different way as well. <laughs> and um, give my interpretation a little bit differently. Um, the, the recent industrial disaster in the ready-made garment sector uh, in Bangladesh and also in, in the world, mostly in Asia, where a large, large majority of workers are women highlight the serious concern about occupational safety and health. Beautifully represented and beautifully retranscripted by Rubaiyat Hassan in this gem of, film, uh, of a film. The Bangladeshi government, employers and workers organization are making important stride in the right direction. With the support of the International Labor Organization and, and many development partners, but still a lot needs to be done, I have to say. Women are disproportionately affected by unemployment, underemployment, and vulnerable employment. Both combined is, is a very stigmatization. It's, it's a kind of a, like stigma on a side. This situation is getting even more dramatic now, given the proportion that we're in the middle of the COVID crisis. And that is very dramatic. 
the International Labor Organization latest analysis um, just show us that uh, the labor market impact of COVID-19 exposes the devastating and disproportionate effect on young workers and especially women workers and analyzes measure being taken to create a safe return to work environment. But for, for more, most governments, including Bangladesh, it is crucial to create an employment rich recovery and quick recovery that also promote equity and sustainability, which means getting people in enterprises working again as soon as possible in a safe condition, of course and help them remain safe for both workers and employers and to keep the business and economy going. This is, this is not just a humanitarian crisis, but also an economic and social crisis. We're talking about 3.3 billion global workforce, informal workers, and the most vulnerable lacking safety protection and access to good, good health care. Moving forward, I would like to just say that it is important to put in place gender responsive labor market policy that will pave the way for more equitable employment outcome and decent work for all. In this regard, I would like to mention something very nice and very good and good news, who's indirectly linked to the movie, is that um, there is a new agreement which was signed by the Republic of Bangladesh with the EU and Germany, which is very, very important agreement. Uh, it was signed um, lately and uh, the European Union and Germany joined forces with the government of Bangladesh to safeguard the livelihood of workers in the export oriented industry and sign an agreement to provide 113 million euro in support to the governments. I mean, the, the Bangladeshi governments already uh, put in place um, a social protection program for unemployed and distressed workers in the ready-made garment, leather good, and footwear industries. And the EU and Germany put money and, and support on, on these initiatives to help and support Bangladesh and indirectly, of course, women, because mostly they are the, the one who's working on this um, sectors, mostly. And by default, this program, which is part of the Team, Euro, um, Team Europe's contribution to fight against COVID-19, as a consequences in Bang has some good consequences in Bangladesh to offer a safety net to workers whose livelihood are affected by the economic dip fallout. It is also contributing to strengthening the resilience of Bangladesh social security system. On December 24th, we, the Europe and the Germany has already transferred 80 million euros to the government of Bangladesh. It's just really recent. And with this COVID pandemic, um, they, um, I mean, with this COVID pandemic has created a public health emergency. Uh, this is an immediate consequences of economic consequences which people are to face in their daily day life. That's why the government, the, the government of Bangladesh responded swiftly with significant stimulus package to the industries and scales up assistance to mitigate socioeconomical impact. That is a very, very good one with a particular attention to Bangladeshi living in a poverty or who are highly vulnerable. And we see that in the movie as well. That, that is something like we can see that, we, that this, this is one example in one factory, but it's just not, you know, um, this is just an example of what can, we, can be done. Um, in this line with the program, uh, there is a guideline who was issued by the Department of Labor uh, and Ministry of Labor of Bangladesh uh, which is in charge actually to temporarily uh, give in charge of temporary cash assistance and will provide workers who suffered income loss during the pandemic. And they started with the garment, um, uh, the ready-made garment uh, factory workers. 
Uh, I think the eligible workers, according to the gu guidelines, um, they're gonna give, I think uh, the guidelines started out to receive 3000 TACA per month per worker for a period up to three months. And they already started to give this money which I think is a really, really uh, a, a good um, uh, good start. And we, we can see in this, in this part that the effort uh, for this was combined and identified with the employer associations. Most of them include the Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association who helped them to, to you know, figure out who needs uh, the first hand, and help uh, with the Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh uh, Nightwear Manufacturers and Exporters Association and Leather Good Associations. And I think that, that that's one step. It's, 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 um, um, it's a kind of a response to what is after the union. In the movie, we see that this is um, this, um, this strong woman trying to have uh, the union. And with this new agreement, we see that the union are uh, able to be a force uh, and to be a, to be um, a strong forces to put the governments and and be a, a real um, decision making uh, changers, game changers, and and I know that um, for my part because we see that we have a lot of women who's coming up from Asia Pacific, mostly working on union, and they are very strong. Um, this is a few example, but uh, very proud to see that, um, you know, I was mostly seeing them afterward, but not during the, you know, uh, what I see on the movie, the organizations, how they, they come up to, to organize themselves to be a union. This is something else I, 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 I get to know through this movie. Um, and it's not directly linked to the movie, but uh, it's mostly linked to the labor market. Uh, and as we talk with uh, Sydney, um, and, and the movie of uh, saying for the next one was, will be probably a little bit different. And, and uh, you, you told me that uh, she went to Jordan, she, Dahlia, and she worked there at one point. And, and this is very common, uh, Sydney, unfortunately, because um, uh, unfortunately we are facing globally something very important um, now is the labor trafficking. But not only labor trafficking, but trafficking in general, human trafficking, and we don't see that in the in the movie. Uh, it's not it's not directly linked to this movie, but um, we have, for example, Bangladesh is one of the world's top exporter of labor and depends on money sent home from about seven thousand uh, hundred people who go abroad to work each year and. Uh, and help their the family and they try to, you know, survive and help their family to survive. Um, every year, thousands of thousands of men and women and children fall into the hands of traffickers when they want to, to go to a new life, when they want to go to create a new life. And uh, unfortunately, this is also something common we see. And uh, um, we, I mean, we see from Western eyes, as uh, the, the, the gentleman says, but uh, I think you also see it on, from your perspective that that is not that easy. Uh, from the Western um, point of view, we see this trafficking uh, differently perhaps, or we live it differently and you live it differently. But uh, well, well, morning. most Friday. biggest problem is, sorry? Well, uh, our most biggest problem is um, that when there is a demand, there is a supply. And for example, for uh, for Bangladesh, uh, uh, the, the the biggest problem is that uh, human trafficking is uh, is is, um, is being a form of modern slavery. It affects the most vulnerable group in our society, mostly women, including young girls. Um, 
but it's, it's also a multi-billion euro industry, turning people into commodities and destroying their dreams for a better life. Human trafficking is though to be one of the fast, fastest growing activity and transnational criminal organization. There are important links between human trafficking and other forms of crime and the exploitation of the most vulnerable in the context of the current migration crisis, as well as an increased use of the internet and new technology to recruit victims. Women migrants from Bangladesh are dominantly employed as domestic workers in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and other Middle Eastern countries frequently fall victims at the hands of the employers. Um, the vulnerability to exploit physical and sexual abuse are, has now become the core issues that remain unaddressed. With expert worry that Bangladesh should look elsewhere for better employment opportunity. A significant number of Bangladeshi women migrant have returned home facing abuse and torture or the form of exploitation. Even though Saudi Arabia is recruiting domestic workers from Bangladesh under a memorandum of understanding signed in 2015. I mean, in the movie, we saw this, 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 this girl, I think as um, you, you nicely put it, uh, when this girl was fired and she had to slightly go to another, you know, um, another life and survive and you see this um, that she was on the street and it's a, and she was doing she was probably a, a doing prostitution but it was it was um, very um, light light way of putting it in this movie um, most of them unfortunately um, they ended up in in the hand of traffickers and sometimes they are not that lucky or I'm not saying that she was lucky. I'm not saying that she was lucky. I'm just saying that some of them was like, they are literally ascended aboard and trafficked in, in a very, um, you know, different ways. Uh, but I also know that um, Bangladesh is working very hard with this new regulation and, and regulation and uh, with, um, you know, new, um, tribunals, uh, they, they put it in place in March uh, last year to, you know, uh, help um, to combat and um, uh, all violence against women and, and traffickers. Um, every day we should strive for an end to cruelty of human trafficking and, and, and also for women's. And uh, we should just um, ensure that every victim became a healthy and confident survivor, either in the labor market, either in trafficking, even in prostitution, by offering them our unconditional support and assistance. But this cannot be achieved without a considerable effort from each other and every one of us. Success can only come through unity. And we saw in this movie that we can be united. This was a beautiful, colorful, um, you know, um, they send us a message and this message was really strong. This was a message of uh, unity. This was a message of respect. This was a message of dignity. This was a great message of collaboration and cooperation. Even, even in the, the darkest time, even in the you know, um, unexpected time because it was an unexpected one. Um, and this is a, a terrible phenomenon to see how women can, um, you know, it's kind of like a phoenix. She was kind of like a phoenix for me. Uh, she was like in this darkest room, in this darkest factory. She was trying to survive. She just wanted to survive for herself in the beginning. And then she ended up to be a phoenix and trying with her, you know, um, with, with her aura to put everyone safe. She just became someone who wanted to save everyone, save her, her friends, save the other girls. Uh, and she did it with dignity. And uh, she was full of color, full of life. And she even gave me the impression that it, all, with all this difficulty, it was kind of all like simple because she was simple. She was so simply fighting and she was simply, you know, doing things in her own way. And I think it was just like 
beautifully done and uh, um, I'm just I'm just like a very, very, even more curious about Bangladesh. Uh, I never been, uh, but they really give me the, the, the wish to go to Bangladesh to, to, to dance in the street like, like they're dancing and being full of life. Uh, even their life are not easy, but I think they are more stronger than, than, than we can ever be. This these women are just amazing, and I think this movie just gave me a lot of hope and a lot of, uh, you know, um, good expectation for um, for the Bangladesh um, film sectors. And I just wanted to finish by saying that uh, we all need a better future of work, and we all need to um, to be free from gender-based violence and harassment. And um, we should not accept any violence in all its forms or um, any places. And uh, we should um, be all equal and have access equally to a decent work and must be treated with dignity and respect. And I feel it that this movie is just a beginning for a good things. Thank you for your participation and input. I know that I also put some other things which was not directly linked to the movie, but for me it is because we just saw one part of the, the, the film is one part of the reality and there's a lot of other, you know, who's surrounding this uh, life. And, and I was thinking about this pandemic. I wanted to, to, to talk about this pandemic. I wanted to talk about this new, you know, agreement signed by Bangladesh and, and, and the EU and Germany, because it is very important. Uh, some people per, perhaps they didn't know about it and uh, perhaps they can go and see their they, they relatives who's working in factories and they can get this money now because it's just started and they, perhaps can apply for this money if someone is listening. And I just wanted to, to um, mention that because this is, this is something which is happening right now and they can apply for three months and um, yeah, and they can help them to survive. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's a lovely to hear from you. It's a nice, uh, well-prepared lecture you have given and uh, mm -hmm. nice work. And I'm sure um, um, this is the beginning, good beginning uh, uh, with uh, you guys uh, to have some uh, thoughts about Bangladeshi films and others. So uh, we'll uh, be in touch more. I mean, we have tomorrow West Meet East program. Maybe you can join us also um, uh, as a viewers or I don't know whether uh, Mr. Ghalib and uh, Sadia Khalid um, they're here, uh, so might be because Ogi is going to join and Sydney is also going to join. So as well as uh, Gida might be joined with Ogi tomorrow. But you can also come tomorrow, I mean, with the West Mid East program. <laughs> if you have time, <laughs> subject to if you have time. But you said also you have a great interest about Indian film. So on day after tomorrow, we have a, a huge uh, seminar. It's about the Shotojit Dress 100th birth anniversary where the famous Indian actress Sharmila Thakur and Dhritiman Chatterjee, they are going to be connected by online. And uh, the, today, Mr. Mofidul Haq is presiding in our session. He is going to present the keynote paper on that day. And also one of our leading uh, actor or cultural activist, famous person, Mr. Asadu Jaman Noor, member of the parliament, he is going to preside the session. And uh, Justice Rifat Ahmed is a very famous art, art critic and uh, I mean, um, like a music, I mean, painting collector. He's also going to speak. And also there's a film critic, Mr. Moinuddin Khaled. He's going to speak also on day after tomorrow. So I'll, I, I welcome you all to join on this day. It's not finished today. Now Mr. Mufi Dalok, he's going to wrap it up. I mean, everything. Uh, but um, maybe um, before, uh, if you have any, anybody has any question, maybe or I don't know, with, uh, then Mr. Mufidullah can come. Uh, maybe you can contact this q &A if there is any q &A.
good afternoon to everyone, those who are present in the auditorium, the distinguished panelists, and my colleagues in the podium, and also those who have joined online. Uh, I think more participation are online than uh, physically, but it's very interesting to see that the auditorium, we have quite a large number of enthusiast film lovers. And that's a good sign that we are in a very difficult time, both nationally and globally. And uh, it's the uh, it's global crisis. And we can say that this is a civilizational crisis and how we will overcome this and what will be life at the end of the COVID, we do not know. But we know for sure that we have to redefine our life. We have to redefine our relationship. We have to redefine the way civilization has uh, established certain norms and certain lifestyle and also certain way to look at life. And I think this festival is uh, very significant. And also this uh, seventh uh, international conference on women in cinema. When uh, Dhaka International Film Festival launched this women in cinema section, we didn't have that vibrant women filmmaker and also the global response that was a new beginning but we found that the theme has got a very important relevance nationally and also internationally and we are thankful to our uh, three distinguished panelists and we have our old friend uh, the keynote paper has been presented by Sydney Levin we have the opportunity to meet her before in I mean, quite a few times in Dhaka. And I think she, her involvement with the Dhaka International Film Festival has given a new dimension. And she is very passionately and involved, very committed to promote the art of film in Bangladesh and also to link Bangladesh with the global film world. And uh, we are really thankful that you have made a very elaborate discussion on taking the journey of the film actually, not the film itself, but how film can connect with the broader uh, world and also can be effective, which is very important part of any film is to screen the film, to show the film and to showcase the film, one needs to be very innovative and also very energetic and look for new contacts and connectivity. And I think she explained that very well and this can be an example for young aspirant filmmakers, that you are making film within the country, but you are making film with a story that has a relevance, not only for what in Bangladesh, but also for the broader com community. And also you have to look for every opportunity that how you can connect your film with the global film circuit and how you can make the uh, screening of the film showcasing the film effective. I think that's, that's very important. And we nationally also, we face this problem with the, uh, we can say the offbeat filmmakers or young aspirant filmmakers who are working outside the mainstream film industry. And these are the lessons we have to learn. These are the opportunities we have to look. And I think we have good friends and that has been expressed by our distinguished panelists, Gida, Mikkel Bust from the Norwegian uh, Nordic Films and Norwegian International Film Festival. She is also a good friend of uh, Dhaka International Film Festival. And also uh, Melika Duran, uh, based in Paris now with the EU. And uh, uh, I think uh, this uh, panel is very interesting in many aspects. It has uh, presented uh, the case study of one film by a very, uh, I will say that very promising and energetic woman filmmaker, Rubaiyat, and she has uh, succeeded in making one after one feature films, which is very, very important lesson for all of us that if you have the determination and if you can mobilize the right kind of resource, I mean, not financial resource, but also the resource in terms of your connectivity or opportunity, and exploit every opportunity that you get, you can find a new way. And I think she has found a new way 
but one unfortunate part is that her film we in bangladesh could not have the much opportunity to see the film meher jaan the film has a very checkered history and very unfortunate it was passed in the censorship there was debate within the censor committee but ultimately the censor committee released the film but there was popular anger i would say regarding the image of bangladesh or image of the freedom struggle that has been portrayed in the film i think we have to be tolerant when we address the issue of art and we should be tolerant to the other voice and this is i think very important for our society that we should be very open if there is any criticism or whether a film hurt the image of the country or make a distortion of the history let there be a debate and truth will always prevail but we should not be afraid and we should not suppress the other voice and i think this uh, is very important also for made in bangladesh that when the film was being discussed it was found that uh, she thought that it will not pass through the censorship but i think such uh, she should also submit it to the censorship and also the civil society has the responsibility regarding the policy of censoring a film if the film is honest let the voice come out and let the other voices also be raised let there be criticism let there be discussion on it and i think today's session is a very interesting in a sense that we have different opinions uh, coming uh, together and we have uh, opposite view or we have uh, views which differ with each other and i think that's the strength of a film festival that's the strength of a artistic forum that we can discuss everything under the sun and we can look at it and also listen to the other voice so that each of us will be enriched and each of us can find things to ponder and also to question oneself also and i will say that i find the presentation long presentation by uh, sydney levin very very interesting she also touched the aspects of the film the film about is about the garment workers and the industry as she has said that it started in 1983 we know that how in a small way the desh government and one of the leading freedom fighter he actually initiated the process and then uh, almost overnight the whole scenario changed and now it is the uh, largest foreign exchange earner for bangladesh and employ more than 3 million people and also mm -hmm. women the rural women especially they found a new place and also we can call it sweat shop but it has its tragic part it has its uh, many dark side but it is also giving employment um, opportunity to the women and that has empowered the women in a new way mm -hmm. and that has changed the equation also within the family and within the society the women as a earner as a money earner has given them a kind of new dimension and new strength in life and their hopes and dreams are shattered in many way and rana plaza is a traumatic experience for all of us and we cannot forget rana plaza but i think bangladesh also learned from rana plaza the whole factory scenario has changed and there was the collaboration with european union also with accord and other policies that has been formulated and also the rights and privileges that has been extended to the workers and i think uh, this uh, uh, i do not know the film but i could from rubaiya's uh, interview i could see that some of this was reflected also in the film but most importantly i think if the film shows us the life of a garment worker which unfortunately we could not portray in our mainstream film we do not have any film of significance of how a garment worker what is her life how she enters into the factory and when she come out how she lives how she spend her spare time what is her dream what is her aim and how she negotiates with everyday life within the family within the environments it is something which is actually we know the garment worker as an entity as a number as a um, earner of foreign exchange and what is the amount they bring for the country what is the significance for the economy but the human story is outside our purview
I think that's the, something we have to deeply think about. It is not in our poetry, it is not in our fiction, and it is not in our film. So I think it's, it's a great responsibility, especially for the young filmmakers, to take the camera and go to the factory, to see the life inside the factory, to see how they live in the, in the what kind of way they define their housing and how their everyday life is. And we see government workers early in the morning, they go to the factory and we see them at the evening when they return. And we can see that the way they walk on the street, it shows a difference. It shows that there are confident women who are serving the, um, the factory, who are serving the economy, and who are also gaining some strength, even through many difficulties. So I think it is very important that uh, whatever way Rubaiyat has treated the film, unfortunately, I do not have the opportunity to view it. But I will say that it's a welcome phenomena. And we can have our criticism. I know very well the scenario with the West, uh, when the West actually uh, defined the market. And it's also another thing that the, the, we say that the owners are exploiting the cheap labor, but also the buyers, the Western uh, conglomerate who dominate the market, they also exploit the government's manufacturer, government's owner. And Walmart is one of the largest uh, sales uh, outlet in the Western world. And they have a motto. They, they show it in their every uh, um, marketplace that uh, every day lower price. And Walmart will come to Dhaka and through their buying house, they will negotiate with the owners that last year you have given me this price and you know our motto everyday lower price. So how much lower price you can offer this year? So this is the way they squeeze the producer. And this is something very terrible. And what happened that for the last 10 years, if you take a statistic of the value of a uh, government's product, you will see that it has not increased. And during the COVID period, which was very unfortunate, and there was a discussion that uh, the factories are in, in difficult time, and factory workers, many of them are going to be laid off and there should be a fund created by the buyers, but buyers has not done anything except maybe one or two, but Zara and uh, H&M and all the major buyers, they haven't done anything for the, uh, not welfare, but for the protection of the workers who are giving them such super profit. So it is not only that, uh, what uh, is happening within the country, within the uh, society, but also what is happening within globally. And also the question came about that, how much the uh, film circuit dominates the filmmaker. And I think that's a very important issue and there is no easy answer. I am a publisher by profession and I have been to Frankfurt Book Fair quite a few times. And I met the editors and I do not know that editors play a very important role in the publishing circuit. And there are editors who are really highly paid and they spend most of the time in Switzerland going to the manuscript, which will be published maybe next summer. And they determine actually few editors, which will, be, which will become bestseller and which will not. And they also determine sometimes the content of the book. And uh, one of the editors, he confessed to me that uh, you see the Kite Runner by Khalidi, 40% of the fiction has been written by the editor. Mm -hmm. That's how the editors also command the market. And these are the problems, actually, the problems in the global market, problems nationally, and problems that we have to face together. But I think there are partners, there are right kind of persons who are also struggling in the West to come out of this domination and scenario. And Dhaka International Film Festival, brings those in Dhaka this year. We are unfortunate that we have only a virtual communication, but even then I think it's a great opportunity and the importance and the, and the possibility of virtual communication is that we can continue this. We do not have to wait for another year. Whatever will come out of the, the exercise in this festival, the discussions in different forums, 
and the way we can promote the young filmmakers. I think that's the main determination of Dhaka International Film Festival and, and also promote the women filmmakers. And that's why this seminar has a great relevance for all of us. And I am really, uh, I feel very honored that I am presiding a session which has become so much enriched by all your contribution. And I congratulate you all. And I think we will continue this discussion and this forum and we will make a change. And we need to make a shift, especially with COVID scenario, with the new world that we all are hoping for, the dream that we all carry. And I think it is possible to make the dream true through the great human approach. So thank you all. Thank you for the great contribution you have made in this seminar. And we have a session after that to uh, present you the declaration of the of the uh, seventh international conference of women in cinema. And we will be actually in contact with Sydney Levin regarding the declaration. But we found it that the ideas that has been uh, expressed in this seminar and also the previous sessions, we actually need to go through it. And at maybe at the end of the festival, we will present the declaration, but we'll be in touch with you with the draft, with the concepts, so that we can make a short, precise declaration, which reflects what actually we have done in the previous days. And also we will address in the coming days. So with uh, your cooperation, we think we can make a, real effective declaration, which is a declaration of intent, but also the declaration of our, uh, we'll say that work plan and how we are going to address the challenges in the new scenario and make it effective. So we'll be in touch with uh, our panelists and we will work on that. And I think uh, uh, Sadia Khalid has a responsibility to make few points, then we will share among us and we will make a conclusion at the end of the festival. So wish you all good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, it's uh, come to the end. I mean, the Omen and Cinema Conference, the seventh edition. Gida was in the first edition in 2014. So this year, 2021. Wonderful. We, mm -hmm. we are having seventh edition. So now it's finished. So we have to think about the eighth edition in 2022 in January. So let's see. So we'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll keep in touch. We'll be in touch. We'll be in the next couple of days. We have a lot of other programs. I'm sure you're going to connect tomorrow. We have a very a special program, West Meet East program is for the local filmmakers. So if you got the chance, please be connect. Sydney will be connect, of course. But uh, Gida and Malaika, if you can join, let's join. And well. another, yeah, another thing is that we are having an open air uh, film screening, first time in Dhaka Film Festival history. We never did before. Uh, uh, in fact, I got the inspiration at the Piazza Grande, Lucarno. Mm. Have the beautiful place, like, but we don't have Piazza Grande. We have a fountain area at the Bangladesh Local Academy. It's called Nondon Theater. We are actually having this session, and uh, we have a one segment, legendary Le leaders who change the world. Our father of the nation has hundred birth anniversary. Uh, according to mm, his birth anniversary, we are uh, having we we, are, we have got some films about Lenin, Castro, um, Arafat. Marshall Tito, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, the, and also uh, one film made by uh, Oshima in Japan, Japanese mm -hmm. film about our father of the nation in 1973. This film we are uh, we are screening in this section. Also, at some films from the tribute of Sotojit Ray. Um, today also we have a Sotojit Ray film. Last two days was Sotojit Ray, but from tomorrow the legendary leaders will be screening will be there. So a lot of people, actually around 1,000 people are watching every day the films. So it's a good idea, good things. I mean, it's coming. It's open air show. So let's see. We want to continue the next year when you'll be in Dhaka. Maybe you'll be joined in the open air show next year. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Have a nice day, my dear. Great. And thank you very much for joining.
Bye bye. Ciao. Arrivederci. Thank you very much. It was great. Au revoir. Au revoir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with the open screening, open air screening. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you for this amazing session. Thank you. Uh, Gida, thank you, Sydney. It was amazing. Thank you, uh, Ahmed, and uh, thank you for all the participants. It was really, really amazing. Thank you. Okay. You, I'm so glad you all were here. I really enjoyed this. Great thoughts. Thank you.